colleagues, it's a great honour to uh, be able to contribute to your leadership development sessions in Defence Medical Services. I stood out of executive leadership positions in uh, late 2018 after spending over 40 years working in public services, of which about 15 of those had been leading organisations at a national level. And I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts uh, on leadership based on that experience. Many of the things that I'll share with you uh, in this session are things that I wish I'd have known at an earlier age, but I didn't. And I think if I had known some of these things at an earlier age, I might have been a better leader. So I share them with you with humility, but also in the hope that they might spark thoughts or responses or reactions in you that would help you to develop your leadership style uh, over the period of time that you lead. My definition of leadership is uh, leaders are people that inspire and motivate people to do things which they might not otherwise have done or inspire people to do extraordinary things that they didn't believe that they could do. And I draw a distinction with management where managers set objectives and then assess whether those objectives have been met. And all organisations need leaders and managers. One is not better than the other. One is not inferior to the other. Uh, both need to exist side by side. I've worked with some great people who've been very good managers and very good leaders. Uh, so they can be side by side together. So let me share with you now some of the things that have helped me over my leadership career, which I hope will similarly uh, spark thoughts uh, and reactions in yourself and uh, might help you to develop. And if they're useful to you, that's great. And if they're not useful, as long as you're clear about why they're not useful, and um, uh, then I think that's my purpose fulfilled uh, in contributing to your uh, leadership development. So the first thing I want to talk about is purpose. And I want to split purpose into two things. Firstly, personal purpose, and then secondly, organisational purpose. But firstly, personal purpose. My personal purpose in employment has been clear to me for a long time. I wanted to undertake a role which made a difference, uh, that made a contribution, in my words, to a more socially just society. And I feel very lucky, very privileged that the jobs I've had over the years have all, all had a very clear focus on making a difference, making a contribution to a more socially just society. I've done that in many different ways. As a social worker, uh, working with children and families, I did that by individual and family work. And latterly, in the Department of Health, advising ministers and politicians in government on policy, uh, I did it by influencing and shaping and then uh, being responsible for the delivery of that policy. And latterly, at uh, the Care Quality Commission, where I was responsible for regulating all health and care services, I did it by ensuring that the people who use services uh, receive services which are safe and high quality and were, uh, were clear about um, people being able to access services in a way that meets their needs. So why was um, personal purpose important to me? Why was this uh, theme of wanting to make a difference, this determination to make a contribution to a more social, socially just society, where did that come from? Well, I was brought up in a relatively working class family in Blackburn in Lancashire. Um, the values I was given through my upbringing were about working hard and doing well, succeeding at school. The subtext of this was, and then you don't have to work, uh, shifts in a textile mill, which is what both my parents did. 
Um, but this was a Catholic family, and the Christian and gospel values of um, Christ were very prominent in my upbringing about treating others as you would treat uh, yourself, about looking out for people who were less fortunate. But I also learned the value of hard work, of pride and of humility, uh, of um, if a job's worth doing, then do it properly and uh, complete the job. And these were formative values for me. And uh, in a Jesuitical way, you know, the Jesuits had a saying, show me uh, the boy at seven and I will show you the man. And the point behind that is not, it's not a gender point, but it's the point about how our early influences uh, shape who we are and how we behave. And I do believe we can change. I do believe we can change through adulthood because we can learn and grow and develop. But my values were very much shaped uh, in the environment that I was brought up in. Uh, honesty, integrity were key themes uh, in the way that I was brought up as well. But when I was uh, uh, in sixth form, I um, was asked if I'd be interested in undertaking uh, voluntary work. Uh, one of the people that taught me was responsible for running Samaritans in my hometown in Blackburn. And... Um, they asked me uh, if I'd uh, volunteer in a project that Samaritans were running, working with single homeless people. And um, throughout my sixth form, I uh, undertook uh, one day a week, one evening a week, uh, voluntary work, working with single homeless people. And this was um, a massive influence on my uh, upbringing my life and uh, again shaped and developed my values because my experience uh, in working with single homeless people contrasted so much with the family upbringing that I had which was loving uh, where I felt valued and supported and safe and then all of a sudden I was working with men and women of all ages who were severely and enduringly mentally ill uh, substance dependent, but whose relationships with family and friends and society more generally had been broken and fractured. And that led me to think about what kind of uh, help do people require to uh, find themselves to begin to get back uh, to make a contribution to uh, their families, their friends, uh, to value themselves, uh, to make a contribution to society. And that made me think about how does society operate. And from that, I went to think about social justice and how we can be a more socially just society. And I think uh, uh, until the point of doing that voluntary work, I would probably have gone away to university to do something like a geography degree or an economics degree. But I chose uh, to explore social work and my choice then was to um, go away to university and do my undergraduate degree in social work qualification so I could qualify and begin to work as a social worker, which is what I did in 1978. And that definition uh, for me of uh, making a contribution to a more socially just society has really been the golden thread that has run throughout my career uh, and indeed in my application for the job at the Care Quality Commission I talked about my sense of personal purpose and that the golden thread through my career was that desire to want to make a difference uh, to people, to want to make a contribution to a more socially just society. So that's my story. Um, many people will tell their story and it will be very different to mine, and, but that will explain why they chose to go into medicine, into the law, uh, into teaching. Uh, in your case, perhaps, why you chose to go into uh, military service and serve your country uh, through making a contribution to the defence uh, of all of us through the work that you do. Um, and what I've found is being clear about my personal purpose has been a massive help through my career, particularly when I've been under a lot of pressure during my career. I've chaired child protection committees where children on the child protection register have been murdered by their parents, um, where children on the child protection register have died in circumstances which were 
um, less than explicable. Um, and in all those moments, um, you've got to be clear about why you were there and what your contribution is, uh, and whether you're part of the solution or part of the problem. And I've found on many difficult occasions throughout my career, uh, throughout my leadership uh, development, my leadership journey, to use that phrase, that clarity about personal purpose uh, has helped me massively to deal with those challenges that we will get throughout our career. Uh, and um, so I offer my story to you uh, so that I hope it can stimulate some thought for you about your sense of personal purpose, about why you do uh, some of the things that you do. Personal purpose isn't the same as what is your job or what is your role. It's really a much more existential question about why are you here and what do you think you're doing through the roles that you occupy. I feel, as I've already said, privileged by having this sweet spot of where my personal purpose aligned with the purpose of the organisations that I've worked for. And that's been a very um, satisfying place to be uh, throughout my career. I said I'd say something about um, organisational purpose. And for me, organisations need to be really clear about why they are there and what they are there to do. And um, it's not always the case that organisations are clear. And it's not always the case that other organisations and other bits of the system are clear why they're there as well. So that sense of um, clarity of purpose is absolutely essential um, for organisations. My experience when I took over at CQC, the Care Quality Commission, is there were many, many interpretations of why that organisation was there and what it was there to do. And I interpreted my job as being to restore political, professional and public confidence in the organisation because I think it had been lost. The committees in Parliament had described the Care Quality Commission as an organisation which was not fit for purpose. And my job was to make it fit for purpose. And I think over the six and a bit years that I was there, the most important thing I did was actually settle the issue of the purpose of CQC. And it was there to ensure people who use services had access to safe, high quality care and uh, worked with services so that they could improve. And at the end of my time uh, in CQC, uh, uh, there was no dispute about the role of the Care Quality Commission. Whether you like what regulators do and whether you feel you've been fairly treated by a regulator is a completely different set of issues than um, being clear about the role of the Care Quality Commission. And similarly, I believe that every organisation needs to be clear about its purpose. Organisations that are not clear about their purpose fail, quite simply. And there's a, a wide literature on this uh, in management and leadership uh, uh, areas, which, uh, uh, which develops this uh, much more, more fully. I'd like to say something now about... Um, Possibly the most important lesson that I learned uh, throughout my leadership career was the value of engaging staff that work in an organisation. And for me, engagement is not the same as communication. Um, over the period of time that I was responsible for leading organisations, I felt that um, I was pretty good at walking the job. Uh, I would visit staff who were on the front line delivering services, whether that was in the community, uh, whether they worked in offices or whether they worked in residential and daycare centres uh, when I was a director of social services. But I, if I look back on it now uh, through the eyes of um, somebody with over 40 years experience rather than somebody with 20 years experience, uh, what I realised is I was going out and I was more on broadcast mode than I was on receive mode. I think I'd gone out to speak to people about the policies of the organisation or what developments we were taking, rather than going out and asking people what they felt about the organisation, what they felt was going well, what was going less well, uh, how what the organisation could do to help them be the best they could be 
or what the organisation was doing to stop people being the best they could be. And I think they're the conversations which are really about engaging staff. It's not just about visibility. It's about listening. It's about active listening and being seen to listen, but then being seen to act on what it is that you pick up when you go out to meet staff and you're listening. And that uh, whole whole approach to engagement, I, I think, has been one of the most important learning points throughout my career. And again, I think there's a vast literature on this, um, whether it's in commercial organisations, retail or in healthcare. In healthcare, uh, Michael West's work, Michael, uh, you can find his work at the King's Fund, um, uh, Professor Michael West's work on engagement, and he's been writing and researching on this now for oh, coming up 15, 20 years probably. And um, the evidence he presents is that uh, organisations that engage their staff in a meaningful way are high-performing organisations. Because in effect, what you're doing is you're actually tapping into the emotional and psychological contract of why people are there. It goes back to my point about personal purpose. As leaders, if you're working with people who are committed to want to make a difference, if you can tap into those uh, emotional and psychological drivers of why people are undertaking a work, you're far beyond what people's contract of employment is. That's where people will give you that discretionary additional effort. That's where they'll go the extra mile for you when you've got that um, um, engagement with them uh, where you're tapping into their emotional and psychological contract. So a key aspect of leadership is, again, going back to my definition about how you inspire and motivate people. And inspiring and motivating people means that find that underlying reason why they're their they're, they're sense of personal purpose. And engagement is one way to do that. And the Florence Nightingale School of Nursing undertook some pretty important research on this, and with apologies to them. But the conclusion of that research was happy nurses equals happy patients. If you're attending to the emotional and psychological needs of uh, the nurses delivering care, then they will re that will result in good quality uh, care for individual patients. And as I say, I think commercial and retail organisations have really uh, found the value of uh, harnessing uh, engagement with people. Lastly, I want to say something about uh, values. Uh, I've shared with you some of my own personal values. Uh, openness, honesty, integrity are key drivers for me in the way that I um, try to behave when I'm in, a work, uh, in any setting, whether that's work or in my uh, personal life as well. And my belief is that what people want from their leaders is authenticity, a sense that um, these are genuine, authentic people who are not putting on a performance because they're in a leadership role, but what you get is a genuineness and an honesty with people. And I, uh, for one, uh, when I look on the leaders that I've admired over my career, then that authenticity is absolutely key. Uh, I want leaders who do what they say, um, Staff spot in a nanosecond people who say one thing and do another thing. And for me, authenticity is a combination, uh, is combining the saying and the doing, uh, and um, that's visible to people. Um, people will judge, judge us as leaders and have judged me in the past, not by what I say, but what I do. And I think that's the ultimate uh, judgment in relation to leadership is uh, does this person uh, do uh, what they say um, so linked to that um, I think these values of uh, openness and honesty uh, and transparency are absolutely crucial in my view in leadership I also think that learning is absolutely key I've often said to colleagues that um, the day I stop learning is the day I need to stop working. And in healthcare, uh, the past uh, decade or so has really been defined by whether we have open systems in healthcare where when mistakes are made, 
uh, those mistakes are owned up to and we learn from those mistakes and we, we use those mistakes as an opportunity to drive improvements. But in order to learn from uh, situations where things don't quite go to plan or go right, you need that openness and honesty. And I think too often in healthcare, the pressure has not been to accept something hasn't gone right, but um, uh, to, to try and deal with it in a way which uh, keeps it closed, uh, perhaps even keeps it confidential. And in one or two rare cases, uh, with people not telling the truth uh, when something goes wrong. And actually, you know, what I've learned throughout my personal life as well as my professional life is you can't develop and grow and improve when something hasn't gone quite right unless you've got that basic openness and honesty. And I think transparency and learning go together and they need to be at the heart of how we are as leaders. The last thing I want to say is that um, healthcare in the 20, as we head for the middle of the 21st century has become more complex rather than simpler. And uh, because many of us uh, will have complex needs, it often needs more than one individual or one professional um, to deliver help, care and support to us. So healthcare has moved towards being a team pursuit. And therefore, I think one of the key ingredients of leadership is collaborative leadership. It's about working with other organisations, other systems or other individuals. I think in the army, those of you that have served uh, abroad and have worked with forces from other countries uh, will have a really strong sense of... Um, the importance of collaborative leadership and of the challenges of collaborative leadership as well. But my belief is that leaders, uh, as we go into the middle of the 21st century, are going to be judged not just how well they lead an organisation, but how well they make a contribution to improvements in systems. And that means they're going to have to work together. Uh, to, to, to steal a phrase from Bill Clinton, uh, my view that um, leadership is all about relationships and um, a key ingredient of uh, uh, relationships is the ability to see the world through the eyes of other people not just through your own eyes that's my definition of emotional intelligence and um, I think this is uh, an absolutely essential skill set for the for the future so um, I hope that gives you some sense of the things that I found important over my career in leadership. I still feel in a non-executive role uh, that I'm still learning about leadership, still growing, finding out what I do that doesn't have an impact and finding out what does work. And I continue to try uh, to learn, to grow and to develop. And I hope what I've been able to do today by sharing my thoughts on my experiences of purpose, engagement of staff, uh, values and uh, collaboration and, and, uh, and relationships will help you. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is, I don't know whether you've come across the acronym VUCA in the past, but it stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity and ambiguity. And that pretty much describes the world that I used to operate in and continue to operate in. And I think uh, leadership in that context will demand that you clear about purpose, values, uh, engagement of staff and collaboration. Thanks for listening. Hope it's helpful. Good luck on your leadership journey, on your leadership development. I wish you well. Thank you.